Now, the car scam is pretty crazy and is considered fraud. Uh, however, authorities seem to be very lenient on these white-collar crimes and work very slowly on these cases, uh, which can be very frustrating for any victims involved. This car was sold to me as 106,000 actual miles and a clean title. I bought the car, paid them cash, took the car home, and the next day, instead of before, the next day I ran the Carfax. And guess what the Carfax showed? Salvage title, rebuilt, reconstructed. It had been in two major accidents where it was deemed salvaged, structurally unsound, and the title was exempted for the mileage. Car title washing is a fraudulent practice where individuals or even car dealerships can manipulate a vehicle's title to hide its true history, which often involves transferring the car's title through multiple states to take advantage of any relaxed title laws, which can also remove any record of previous damage, salvage status, or other negative information. This results in a quote-unquote clean title where potential buyers can be deceived into purchasing a vehicle that appears to be in better condition than it actually is. This can also lead buyers into unknowingly purchasing vehicles that are stolen, rebuilt, severely damaged, or even involved in accidents. Here's an example of this happening to a woman in Virginia. And you called the guy that you bought the car from. Correct. What did he say to you? So the car was paid for. Bridgecrest tells News 4 it's now working with law enforcement to understand what occurred and the unlawful actions the seller took to fraudulently sell the vehicle for which he never paid. And since Barbara was able to purchase and register the car, unknowingly using a fraudulent title, the vehicle identification number was linked to her home address. And that's where the tow truck was sent to repo it. I'm shocked. It, I'm speechless. I hear stories and stuff like that. But I never knew I'll be a victim one day. The person who sold uh, the consumer a the car clearly is the person who committed the fraud. Now this next scam is pretty clever. You gotta watch out for it. And it can happen to you when you're trying to sell your car, your vehicle. So last year, a friend of mine was selling an Audi A4. It was 2019. And as soon as he listed it up online for sale, he got a message from an interested buyer or so he thought. The conversation went on and eventually the buyer asked for a motor vehicle report. Now that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with asking for a motor vehicle report. However, the buyer insisted that he bought the report from auditvinreports.com and apparently his name is Trevor. He goes, sorry Trevor, but I only use those sources that I trust. Auto check is what I can provide. Anything else is on you. Now this is where Trevor started to get a little angry as his scam wasn't going over as smoothly as he probably hoped it would. He goes, it's not my vehicle to be purchasing a report for. You are selling it or else I would do as I always did whenever I post my vehicle for sale online. Blah, 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 blah. Trevor clearly had an ulterior motive at play as autocheck.com is a pretty reputable site. So why in the world does he want a motor vehicle report from autovinreports.com? Pretty interesting. So let's take a look at this site and see what we can find. Okay, so right here we have ourselves a website that looks fairly simple and appears to do the same thing as AutoCheck, but what's so great about it? So I clicked on the Why Choose Us tab and it read, it's an exciting time for the industry involved in AutoVin reports. Whereas once it was just Carfax that performed such services, there are now dozens of companies offering similar or expanded features. Audivin Reports is proud to be part of the new face of the industry. Yeah, okay, buddy. He then received another message from another interested buyer that now wanted him to buy a report from GetVehicleReports.com. And both buyers' way of texting is almost identical. By the way, what's your name? I'm Wade. By the way, what's your name? I'm Trevor. And that's when I realized this must be a group of scammers that are running the same type of scam and are using the same scripts. So I immediately became interested and began looking into Wade's site, which to my surprise is shockingly similar to Trevor's website. And just like before, I clicked on the Why Choose Us tab. Scammers love including these on their fake websites. And once again, I was greeted with the same exact script. It's an exciting time for the industry involved in vehicle history report. Blah, 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 blah. So that's when I began wondering to myself like, okay, how many of these fake websites have these scammers created? So I copied their paragraph and pasted it into Google and oh my goodness, I got a whole search page of websites that are exactly identical just under different domains. The list literally went on forever. So obviously there has to be a team of scammers that are running these scams, that are running these fake websites, managing all of these fake websites. But why? Either so they can steal your initial payments or your actual payment method information, which is why it's so important to check that you're using a company's actual websites, not a clone, not a fake website. Scammers will try anything that they can think of to try to get unsuspecting individuals to enter in their personal details into their fake websites, such as payment method information like card numbers and pins, PayPal logins, etc. You just mind putting your hands behind your back for me, okay? I'm gonna put these on nice and 
comfortably as possible, okay? And I'm sure we've all been to the store at some point in our lives where we've been asked by the cashier if we'd like our receipts. And if we have no intention of returning the item we're buying or using the receipt for tax purposes, we'd probably say no thank you. But what if I told you a cashier was using this method to make thousands of dollars per day? Here's how the scam worked. A cashier working at Home Goods would often ask customers if they would like their receipts. And most of the time, customers would decline. The cashier would then take the receipts, make a fraudulent return, and then take the money right out of the register, making anywhere between $500 to $1,000 per day. When officers arrived, they met with the manager who explained to them exactly how the scam worked and how the employee in question didn't even attempt to conceal her fraudulent activities. Once officers collected all the information they needed regarding the scam, it was time to confront the employee. She was coming in to work her regular shifts and probably run her scam again. But little did she know, police were waiting to put her in handcuffs. Not her debit visa, but a friend gave it to her. Um, and some were to gift cards, store gift cards. Some of the gift cards she used, all of the cash she took. Um, she's also admitted to stealing merchandise from the store for like $48 that she didn't pay for. Okay. Um, so, okay. 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 My name is Officer Lowry. I'm the investigating officer. Okay. Um, I got a brief idea of what's been happening, what's been going on. Um, I'm willing to give you the opportunity to kind of speak and tell me your side of the story if you want. Now, because I am conducting a criminal investigation, which I suspect you of a crime, I have to read you your rights before I do that. You know what's going to go? What what was going on happening? Uh, at this time, I am going to place you into custody, okay? I just got to run you up to county jail up there. You'll probably get released on a bond or something. I'm not really sure. You just might put your hands behind your back for me, okay? I'm going to put these on nice and comfortably as possible, okay? The suspect was charged with grand theft and was sentenced to a year of probation. This was her third time being arrested for theft. My guess is she isn't too good at stealing if she keeps getting arrested for it. But hey, who am I to say? She's good. Okay. Right. So there was a huge fraud bust a few days ago now, back on July 19th, 2024, where two men faced charges in connection to a huge nationwide fraud scheme. Gwinnett County police say scammers took eight companies for more than $440,000. Police say they caught one of the suspects red-handed. Christopher King is in Lawrenceville where the scammers tried to strike. Police say Winston Dugan tried to cash a check here at this bank. Problem is, it was bogus. This is why I always say you have to know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to get involved in, you know, anything like that, anything of this nature. I mean, don't be a dumbass. Get caught trying to cash fake checks. Let me see the ID. Police are not buying his story. You know this is no good, right? Oh, you know it's no good, sir. I can feel it. I can look at it. Officers arrested Winston Dugan and confiscated his cell phone. That's when they discovered that he had multiple uh, bank accounts, fraudulent bank accounts. Investigators were suspicious of Dugan, so they did their homework, leading to much bigger crimes. Investigators say Dugan would target companies around the nation, sending emails, posing as a vendor. Dugan was using stolen financial information from eight companies in several states, from California to Texas to Florida, where he successfully stole over $190,000 in one day. In the summer of 2022, an employee of a company in Illinois unknowingly sent money to Dugan, who she thought was a vendor of the company she worked for. Police reports state that in that same summer, Dugan sent a $133,000 check to Mikhail Kais, with both men being indicted just a few days ago this week. As for the victims, they will have to work with the bank and investigators to recover their stolen funds. The bank will usually investigate fraud claims, which can involve reviewing transaction records, verifying claims, and sometimes coordinating with law enforcement. Most banks have policies in place to protect consumers from fraud and may reimburse lost funds if said claims are validated. However, specific procedures and protections can vary depending on the bank and jurisdiction. If you receive a call from a number that appears to look familiar, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is, you know, because scammers now today here in 2024 can spoof numbers. They're able to spoof numbers in order to appear as someone that they are not. The FBI, the IRS, your grandmother, anyone they want. Now, I've been watching a team of scammers for the past week or so learning exactly how they do this scam. And today I'm going to share everything with you. But first, let's learn how the scam works. 
Scammers can lure in unsuspecting victims with a pop-up on their computer screen that says something along the lines of your computer is at risk and you need to contact Microsoft or Apple in order to get it fixed. Now, how do they accomplish this? By creating fake websites with malicious scripts. And if you stumble across one of these websites, they can force your browser to display a fake pop-up. And if you aren't as tech savvy, you may assume that your computer is actually at risk and contact that number, which then connects you directly to the scammers. Now these specific scammers are operating out of Pakistan and they'll tell you that you need to connect to Microsoft's secure server, which essentially just means they'll have you download any desk, which is hilarious because this program has nothing to do with Microsoft. It's literally screen control software. And when you download the software and give the scammers your ID number, they will then be able to control your computer. Now, because I live life on the edge, I actually let these guys from Pakistan control my computer. However, all they ended up doing was running some commands and telling me how I had a bunch of hackers in my network. The problem that you're facing is a cyber attack. They would then tell you how your bank account may have been compromised by these foreign hackers. And they convince people of this by having their own bank deliver the bad news. Then one of their coworkers will call you using your bank's actual number. But how did they do that? First and foremost, they're not using a mobile device to place and receive these phone calls. They're using a computer with software known as voice over internet protocol, which converts a phone call from analog one to a digital signal. These calls are then routed to a private breach exchange or PBX. And by editing these PBX files, scammers are essentially able to display any outgoing number that they want. And last but certainly not least, we have the prime activation scam. Now this scam works when you're trying to activate prime on a new TV. The app tells you what site you need to go to, but if you search for the sites or click on one of these sponsored links, you're gonna end up on a scammer's website instead. You'll enter in the code here but it doesn't really matter what you enter in because it is a fake website. It will then inform you that you need to call them to verify. Now in the past, scammers would get into your Amazon account by tricking you into sharing your two-factor authentication code. They would then activate Prime for you and send you an invoice. But now they're saying that there's an error that needs to be fixed via them taking remote access of your phone. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a peek behind the curtains of the fraud that is happening here today in 2024. Last year in 2023, Americans lost over $10.3 billion to online scammers according to the FBI. There's a man named Andrew Johnson, who's the director of finance at a company called Nine Corp. And essentially he ended up engaging in what we now know today as earnings management, right? Well, about a year and some change later, the FBI came knocking on his door. And the reason why was because of the timing, it was really all because of the timing, his superiors wanted to recognize revenue too soon because they wanted to satisfy Wall Street's expectations. And while they really weren't all that interested in learning about accounting or any of the details of accounting, they didn't want to know any of the important stuff. All they wanted to know is if the numbers were working. We're trying to be acquired. Just make it work. And while Andrew didn't receive any other personal gain from the situation, he was simply just following instructions from his superiors at a company he was working for. He did know it was wrong. But again, he's trying to satisfy expectations and simply just be a team player instead of causing any friction within the company. And so what Andrew did was he overestimated something that made the company's financial statements look better than they actually were. So obviously it was wrong, but what was he going to do? Is he, is he going to push back? Unfortunately, he did not, which is exactly what landed him in federal prison. When taking an accounting class, they're going to teach you something about the accounting equation. And what that equation is, is simply assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Which means if I do something on the left side of this equation, then I have to do something on the right side to make it balanced. Why auditors get in trouble when fraud happens? If I take cash away, what am I plugging in on the right side of that equation to make it balanced? Because everything has to stay in balance. So when fraud happens, you have to be pretty savvy to make everything work. Which reminds me of a woman named Rita Cronwell. Rita Cronwell. Rita Cronwell. Rita Cronwell. The largest municipal embezzlement in U.S. history. She stole $53.7 million over a 20-year period and kept balanced financial statements the entire way through. So she was manipulating a whole lot of numbers like a magician and was playing with some very large sums of money. Clearly, she was good at what she was doing, until she wasn't, of course. But to be able to keep up with such fraudulent behavior for so many years, performing very calculated bookkeeping, and keeping track of such records for 20 plus years is truly remarkable because remember everything must remain balanced so you might ask yourself well why does fraud happen if auditors are supposed to come in review everything and opine if everything is the way it's supposed to be well financial statements are the property and responsibility of management 
And management's job is to compile them because they make all the decisions surrounding company transactions, right? And the auditor's job is to come in to step into the breach and say what management has said is correct or incorrect. So obviously, there's bound to be a little bit of friction there, a little bit of conflict. Because guess who pays auditors? The client. So how would your client like it if, you know, you have bad news to tell them about their financial statements that they just put together? Andrew is a perfect example of a CPA that was placed into a very difficult situation. He knew generally accepted accounting principles, but yet he didn't feel comfortable enough to, you know, give any pushback to his superiors. So accountants and auditors often find themselves in very tough dilemmas. Did Arthur Anderson, who was the auditor for Enron, did they really want to lose Enron as a client if they said, in these transactions, you don't have the right things disclosed. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. You know what Enron would have done? They would have simply just went and found another firm. And that's the life of a CPA. That's the life of an auditor. But you know what? At the end of the day, you have to do what's right, no matter how difficult of a situation you're placed into. You have to follow the laws. And pressure impacts decision making. I understand that. But understanding these pressures can help, hopefully help the future accountants of the world understand the importance of their job and just how difficult of situations they can be placed into. You know, I try to let everyone understand, everyone who plays an essential role in the corporate level of a company, it's not about if if fraud shows up, it's more of a when it shows up in your career. How are you going to respond? Because those choices could be the reason you and your company succeed or fail, ultimately.